So here we are in the Global Ed Conference um, 2017, and you join us in time for the keynote, and the keynote presenter in this session is Kevin Crouch. And Kevin has led teachers and administrators at three different schools through the transformation of becoming innovative digital age organizations. And I know he's going to have lots of very relevant and interesting things to share with us. I'm going to let him do his own introduction and tell us a little bit more about himself. Um, so we're going to move on to his first slide. And Kevin, if you can enable your mic and press talk and your video, I'm going to put my video off. And if you uh, things questions occur to you whilst um, Kevin is presenting, please pop them into the chat. And he's got some time at the end of the session to address any questions. So a big welcome to you all. And a big thank you as well to our sponsors which uh, uh, I had a slide there, but I can't find it. There we go. OK. So a big thank you to the sponsors that make this conference possible. Over to you, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Um, hopefully, you can all hear me. My audio is working solid. So I'm going to turn, okay. my, I'm going to turn my video off uh, shortly. I just wanted for you to be able to um, you know, put a face to a name and uh, you, you know, um, sort of meet me at least uh, virtually on a video, and I will I'll turn my video off and just kind of move on with the presentation if that's okay as we get going. All right, so um, number one, thank you. I'd just really like to thank everyone, uh, you know, especially our hosts for giving me this opportunity to deliver a keynote at the Global Education Conference. It's, I've been a part of this conference for many years. And this is, a, this is a great opportunity for me. Uh, my name is Kevin Crouch, and I am currently the Director of Technology Services for Consilience Learning, um, a nonprofit organization. You know, and our mission is to uh, transform learning essentially one school at a time. Um, I've been an educator for 16 years, and have worked all over the world with a variety of different schools and in many different capacities. And at every school I have worked with, I would consider myself a change agent in everything from rethinking technology access to rethinking learning and curriculum. And hi, Rita. And I think I've missed a couple of the people that have joined. Um, but I think, you know, there is a part of the reason why we're here is that there is no better time to be a change agent, I think, than at the present. Uh, where we have many mindsets and many technologies and global imperatives that have come together and kind of set a perfect stage to pursue, you know, powerful global pro project-based learning. Essentially, that is it's at the core of my talk. And with that, I'm going to turn my video off so it's not a distraction, and we'll move forward with the presentation. Okay, let's just get used to these. There we go. So I would say probably most of us are probably at this conference because we teach kids or we teach teachers. Um, and we are interested in how we can help our kids learn the knowledge and skills, not just about how they may thrive and you know, hopefully survive in the world, but what we all need to thrive and survive in this world. And we're, we're talking about those tried and true 21st century skills and our big 21st century global issues, many of which are not really new. Um, you know, and in, in these various classrooms of ours, we probably spend quite a bit of time discussing with our learners the many global problems that we face. And sometimes perhaps we unintentionally transfer, you know, much of the weight of these problems onto our learners. <clears throat> so that someday, hopefully, they may be a leader who helps find uh, solutions to these problems. And I know there are uh, other reasons for why we engage in these, in, in these projects, but I think this is kind of at the back of our minds um, uh, frequently. And so I'm just going to check the chat here. And I don't have any questions right now, but uh, so I'll keep going.
And so just a little bit of a background on, you know, kind of what has brought me here recently is that our organization, Consilience Learning, helps schools get better at making and tinkering, setting up maker spaces, running maker workshops, doing robotics, and getting teachers the professional learning they need to use these spaces effectively. Uh, we also do quite a bit with um, innovation and using data in schools as well because these are all areas of growth we feel for schools that are going to help them transform. And <clears throat> these sessions that we offer, um, you know, they help kids learn and practice the skills and mindset of innovation, which is part of the purpose of this talk. They are highly contextual, they're highly problem-based, and they're increasingly global. Um, and so I'd like to start kind of set a context for this. I'd like to share an anecdote from one of these sessions that is particularly helpful uh, for this conference. Um, so at a workshop last fall with our students at a TRI uh, summit that we held, which stands for Technology, Robotics, and Artificial Intelligence, there was a very perceptible, odd vibe in the room that seemed to get in the way of the students' engagement. They just didn't really seem like they wanted to be there. They didn't really seem like they were interested in doing these types of activities. And my colleague, Linus, he just had a hunch. And he asked the kids in the room to raise their hand if they were hopeful for the future. And surprisingly, perhaps shockingly, only five or six kids out of a room of more than 20 raised their hand. And this was, this was a bit of a downer. Um, and so, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of leave this as a dot, dot, dot. There's more to this story that I will get to a bit later on in this talk. But I think through no fault of our own, uh, we might actually find the same scenario in many of our own classrooms around the world. And I know that there have been other keynotes on this, on this subject in the past. Um, you know, a sense of, um, there's a, you know, a lack of optimism and hope in many of our um, learning organizations around the world. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not hard to imagine in many ways why this is the case. You know, put yourself in our, in our, in our learners' um, shoes. Uh, our students see and hear reminders of these issues constantly, issues that they don't really understand, be it at home or at school. And, with, you know, coupled with these reminders is, unfortunately, a lack of agency. Um, and perhaps another factor is a lack of clarity and understanding of exactly what the issue is, what impact is it having, Hanusa? Um, and, you know, what all the complex dynamics are around it. And, you know, I have to say then that understanding complexity is, in fact, one of the key outcomes of global learning. It's an, it's a, it's an outcome of this conference. It's an outcome of hopefully what we're all trying to achieve in education. It is also one of, our, of the ISTE benchmarks that are widely used around schools in the world. Um, this benchmark, which reads, break problems into component parts, extract key information, and develop descriptive models to understand complex systems, is, interestingly enough, not under the global collaborator standard, but rather under computational thinking standard. So uh, take that for what it's worth, but it's just an interesting um, it's just in frame uh, for the rest of, of this talk. So I brought up some big ideas here, um, and I'd like to unpack a couple of these. One, I'd like to, let's look at agency and complexity. Hi, Phyllis. Welcome. As people join, I'd like, you know, it'd be great if you could just throw in the chat where you're joining from and uh, just introduce yourself. So um, let's look at agency. Agency is, you know, the power to act. It's a sense of ownership. Um, the ability to execute and control one's own actions. It's about self-efficacy and personalization. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk 
in education, especially over the last five to ten years, about the impact that our school, as currently in the form that it currently is, but the impact that it's having on learner agency. And, you know, not intentionally, it, people may argue that the way we do school, in fact, uh, reduces learner agency over time. Um, and the other aspect is that we discussed is complexity. And, you know, complexity is, in fact, related to agency in many ways. Um, and they're, it's all, they're both at the heart of both innovation and global learning. So much of what schools do with students in the younger years is designed to help our learners work through complex situations. And one of the ways that we work through complex situations is by finding innovative solutions, you know, that resolve paralyzing trade-offs. And you can see that under complexity, complexity is, uh, has many factors, many things that, that contribute to it, including multiple inputs and outputs that are, many of them are linked together, that cause uncertainty um, in our systems. Uh, you know, it's relative, so what's complex to one person might not be seen complex to another. And things become more and less complex over time, depending on our understanding of them. Complex systems involve often multiple trade-offs. So, you know, when you try to, um, you know, when you try to solve one issue, you create unintended consequences somewhere else, like the big pile of spaghetti. Um, and so, you know, these two things together, as I will, be, as I will show as we go through this, um, really are a couple, in my view, um, some of the pillars of what we're trying to achieve uh, with global learning um, and with innovation and maker learning and uh, using data. All right, so I'm going to check for questions. If you have any questions at any time, if there's something you'd like me to clarify, feel free to throw that question right in the chat and I will uh, attempt to address it. So, you know, in spite of this picture that I'm painting here, many of you would probably agree that all too often you take a far too simplistic approach to problem solving. Our problems may seem on the surface kind of monolithic, scary, um, we tend to go at them with the most obvious and direct tools. And too often we address the symptoms and not the root causes. Uh, these are you know, well-known issues. And what we hope to teach our kids, especially with global and social issues, is that these problems are indeed very complex. They're sensitive. They require lots of good thinking around them from lots of people that are dedicated to solving them. In fact, you know, most of our experts believe that our world's problems are indeed too complex for any one inspired person or government agency to solve. You know, these problems are going to take teams of collaborators with innovative ideas and tools to help solve them. And ultimately, what we are seeking are thoughtful, collaborative, and simple solutions. Um, you know, the quote on the page, the only simplicity to be trusted is the simplicity to be found on the far side of complexity. Meaning that we have to, we can't look at the, at the simple solutions, we have to work through the complexity to find simplicity. There is no magic wand, in fact, that will make these problems go away, other than, heaven forbid, you know, massive global contraction of growth and innovation, which we certainly do not want to see. Um, increased complexity is, in fact, inevitable. In times of intense growth, these have historically always led to increased complexity. And we have to continue to embrace an open and collaborative approach to data collection, ownership of ideas, in order to help bring about real change in this, in this context. So, 
Many of you who have been doing this for a while, you probably know a little bit about Robert Hanvey and his five dimensions of perspective. Or if you are a social studies teacher, this is probably social studies one on one for many of you. Um, and so I'd like to take a moment just to just to paint a little context. So before I go on with the rest of my presentation, I'd like to help you understand what is what is the frame uh, of global learning you know that I'm that I'm talking about when I want to start to dig into you know making and using data um, for innovation. And so you know the seminal work on this. Uh, topic by Robert Handy. This comes from the mid-1970s where he painted a continuum of increasing awareness and agency um, and increasing complexity as well. And so, you know, it, it takes us from the idea of perspective consciousness, which is it's an awareness that each of us has a worldview or a cognitive map, if you will, that is not universally shared by others and may be shaped by, by factors that we are unaware of and even unable to control through, it takes us through knowledge of world conditions, which is also called state of the planet awareness. Um, and this is the knowledge of prevailing and emergent world conditions, including population growth, migration, economic conditions, natural resources, um, physical, environmental, political developments. Um, and all the way up through international and intranational conflict, right? Um, so dimension three would be cross-cultural awareness, that, that sort of expanding respect for and knowledge of the diverse ideas and values and practices found in human societies throughout the world. Now, hopefully you're seeing, for those of you who have engaged in global learning, you're seeing a theme here of, way, of things that you may have integrated knowingly or unknowingly in your uh, learning. Um, this moves on then to knowledge of global dynamics, which now we're getting into some pretty uh, heavy and complex stuff, understanding how the world works, and in particular, understanding the key features and mechanisms of various global systems, economic, political, ecological, social. Now, if you, depending on where you teach, you know, an understanding of how the world works is something we begin um, teaching our kids in early years, you know, especially in a PYP program, for example. Understanding how the world works begins at a young age um, and continues all the way up through graduation. And then the, the last one, knowledge of alternatives, also called sort of awareness of human, of our choices. Um, you know, it, well, especially looking at alternatives to such practices as the sort of unrestrained growth. Um, we're looking at, you know, current foreign aid and technical assistance policy. I mean, that's at a, at a very high level, yes, in, in addition to things like, you know, just recycling on campus and, you know, what, what can I use other than this plastic bottle? Um, but ultimately, we're trying to um, help our learners understand um, alternatives on a very large scale as well as a small scale. All right. Okay, so. so there are um, several different types of global projects. I'm going to, I'm just going to kind of present here. Many of these you're probably familiar with um, that help move our learners through this continuum, if you will. And at its most basic in addressing primarily dimension one are our interpersonal exchanges. So these are our ePals, you know, visiting and virtual experts, mystery Skypes, global lit circles, et cetera. You know, these experiences are very meaningful and very powerful for our learners, and they lay the foundation for these future global learning activities. Um, and these have been around for, for many years. And following, following these types of activities, often you'll, you'll begin to engage in what we call intercultural exchange, which adds a level of complexity to our projects and begins to open our eyes even wider to the sources of differing perspectives. And this is where we share cultural artifacts, our folklore, 
Um, we discuss our local customs and, and, and their importance to our society. Um, they can be intensely personal and they can also, you know, you know, be very interpersonal. These types of projects, you know, in concert with these interpersonal exchanges help us move through knowledge of world conditions into the cross-cultural awareness zone. And as you can see, these are different approaches to learning. And each one takes our learners just a little bit further. So, you know, this one is uh, very closely linked to the other ones and, you know, perhaps may not even be seen as a, as a type of project on its own, but it adds a layer of, of complexity to, um, to global learning projects. And, you know, it, it, this involves student-created artifacts, um, and it, these are really great at planting seeds of agency in our learners um, at a fairly simple level. We give them an opportunity to express themselves in addressing an issue in front of an authentic audience um, that might be global, right? And this might include um, <clears throat> narrative writing, poetry, video, fine art, even music. And, you know, this may not be ideal for every one of our learners, but it, if given an opportunity, many of our learners will, will choose to do this, and they love having an audience, right? Okay, great. Teresa just pointed out that online intercultural exchange is the focus of her research. That's great. Um, well, I'd love to hear more about that. Thanks, Teresa. And so, moving up in complexity, and feel free to pause me if you need any clarifications on this. Um, you know, at some point, when our learners are ready, and they can actually be ready at a fairly young age, if anybody has done any sort of data projects with elementary school kids, I'd love to hear about it. But um, when kids are ready, we can begin to really unpack these complex issues more and more. Um, we can begin to dig in on specific concepts. These can become highly conceptual, um, following the very specific lines of inquiry. We can make predictions and experiment on stuff together globally. We can do this as shared experiences among many different schools even in a problem-based context. Um, and, you know, ideally this will involve the collection and analysis of data. Uh, and this isn't, this doesn't just have to happen in science class, really. It could happen in, in a very highly interdisciplinary uh, learning context. And I'll talk about this more um, in a moment. So we're, you know, as we move through complexity, ultimately what we hope to find are, you know, global learning opportunities for, for our kids that truly are problem-based. Um, we want to involve them in real-world problem solving on both the local and global level, which would hopefully bring our students all the way through the, to the fifth level of alternative, looking at alternatives because we can help them take action, you know, which will require them to learn and apply many of these digital age and 21st century skills um, that we will ultimately call upon to make these projects a success. So hopefully, so it's a bit of a digression perhaps, but hopefully I'm helping paint a picture of, of you know, where we're going to begin to um, bring in these ideas of making and data together. <clears throat> So these, bringing these two, these data collection and analysis and problem-based learning together, uh, you know, this is where the concepts of action and change really start to take effect, gain some traction. You know, this is the action piece. This is where all of our knowledge of cultural and social differences and similarities, of course, start to become an understanding of how the world works. The knowledge of global dynamics coupled with the knowledge of alternatives, provides students with, you know, a fertile ground to practice inquiry, literacy, and math skills in the process of finding feasible solutions to local and global problems. So uh, think, of it, it, think of it like this. It works this way. 
So activities in the vein of cultural awareness help develop a connection between cultures. Then you work collaboratively to collect and share data that creates a powerful context within which you can examine these shared issues. These could be problems that are global but also have local connection. It doesn't have to be scientific in nature. It could be social or cultural as well. And any small application to any of the world's, you know, big problems will work. So, for example, looking at poverty indexes and connecting them to local observations or researching and collecting data about local endangered species and sharing those out. Um, those are just a couple of examples that we can keep in the back of our mind as we move forward here. And we'll pause for just a moment. Okay. Hi, Susan. Good to have you here. So, you know, all of these skills needed to make all of this work, they are not, of course, learned in isolation. We do not teach these things didactically. They are learned socially and constructively in the same manner, ma manner that kids learn how to play with each other in childhood. There isn't one lens of knowledge through which we all see this clearly. You know, and the picture is much more interesting um, than what you might imagine. So if you believe that kids, you know, don't learn everything they need to know in kindergarten um, and that there's still hope uh, to solve these problems and learn collaboratively in order to do this, then please, I invite you to stay with me as I move on through this presentation. So just a, just a bit of a splash on social constructivism. Perhaps you have uh, heard of this. Um, and, you know, I mentioned socially constructed knowledge, and this is that's what we're dealing with here. For our purposes, it's the theory of social constructivism, which in essence, you know, extends constructivism by incorporating the role of other actors and culture in learning and development. And in this sense, it can be contrasted with social learning theory by stressing interaction over purely observation. It's really that interaction key that matters. And we're really talking about where we're giving students, again, is the term agency, active agency in their learning, and that this social interaction is a key factor. Right? So we're going to revisit these different types of projects um, that you know, maybe you've had some experience with and kind of superimpose them on a different continuum, which you might call relative complexity, um, and over the five dimensions that we talked about earlier. And so, you know, this is something that I did bring up earlier in the talk, um, and we're just, you know, going to quickly examine how, um, for example, ultimately, and this is not to imply that one, that any type of this project is better than another, but perhaps only that as you begin to take on um, these more complex problems, you're actually introducing your kids to the types of complexity that they are going to need to understand in order to be problem solvers right, uh, in the future, where we have this uh, you know, global dynamics and alternatives you know, using data and working through complex problems um, can be far more complex in terms of what a teacher has to do and what students have to do than uh, an interpersonal exchange, for example. Okay. So I'm going to now bring in this, I'm going to be talking about the relationship between complexity. I want to dig into this concept of complexity a little bit more and try to establish this connection to data. And there are several reasons why situations you know, can scare us away from trying to tackle them. And one issue, you know, may often appear more complex, you know, than it really is simply because we don't understand it or we make too many assumptions about the problem. 
that may or may not be true. And, you know, data is nothing more than information that can take these nebulous ideas and make them tangible for us. It's like shining a light into a dark room, you know, or building a model of something that hasn't, you know, we haven't built yet. Uh, data gives us something real to talk about and reflect on together rather than simply getting bogged down and, you know, baseless claims and assumptions. And this becomes ever more real <clears throat> when we consider that we, you know, we know that we are in the information age. Some people might call it the knowledge age. You know, and what, you know, what does that mean? Well, depending on your preference, this is an age where we deal, we share, we create and we guard and we build knowledge. Um, and, you know, data helps us make that knowledge more tangible, right? So, uh, welcome, Anissa. Um, and I, Mohammed says, thanks, you know, this happens quite often. It's very true. Um, yeah, I mean, I think. You know, a lot of this is anecdotal, but I think it's, you know, I think you, we live through this, uh, you know, in every day of our lives, especially in schools. Schools are in very complex places, and we, we do so much of our work based on assumptions and gut instinct rather than actual data about what's happening with our learners. So I'm going to move forward. And so, you know, I'm going to come back to global learning here. And, you know, global learning in this context, and the great thing about this is that its very nature is complex. I mentioned this earlier. Engaging students in collaborative problem solving, uh, both through and about the project they're working on, helps them see this complexity. These types of projects are not easy. You know, they require lots of organization and planning. They need some innovative problem solving themselves to overcome logistical obstacles. And the best global learning teachers that I know, they do this with their kids. They don't take this on themselves. You know, ten, just think 10 years ago, I mean, it could be even five years ago, depending on the school that you're working at, or maybe even the school you're at today, you know, few teachers would have dreamt of undertaking any sort of collaborative problem solving uh, with schools around the world, no matter how pressing, you know, the issue, you know, and again, the goal is not to create unnecessary complexity. The simplest solutions are the best in the end, but to help our learners understand it and work through to the simplicity on the, on the other side, you know, we're bound to introduce and work through some of this complexity in our projects. If you have any questions, feel free to throw those in the chat. As I move forward, we do have an opportunity for Q&A also at the end, and I'll get to that. So I'm going to move into uh, a little bit of talking about data. And okay, that was the right one. So, you know, data. Is, uh, is a great example of, of something that's complex that a lot of us shy away from. Um, and when thinking about the role of data, both in terms of the collection and sharing of it, we have so many opportunities now that were not available j just a decade ago, as I mentioned earlier. You know, for example, how do we pursue the problem of collecting data in one place so it's synchronized, so all stakeholders have access to it in its most current state. How do we analyze that data as a group, you know, to get as many different perspectives as possible? How does all this get documented and shared so record of the analysis persists for others? You know, historically, these have been wicked problems, show-stopping problems that are essentially child's play today with the technologies that we have. You know, solutions as simple as collaborative spreadsheets and forms, um, you know, open source visualizations on the cloud, um, infographics, these are highly scalable and manageable by most teachers in this day and age for free. And the insights from these projects can be synthesized and published to a global audience 
with minimal investment in time and money. And really the only thing that is necessary is somebody to help a teacher uh, work through the issues and an internet connection and a computer, you know, and you can, you can tackle some of these pretty powerful issues. And, you know, when we talk about data, there are, you know, I just, I did mention gathering our own data, but uh, uh, also, you, you know, I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, in, more, in more depth, but just think about all the data that you have access to currently in this world simply by downloading it from sites such as the World Health Organization, United Nations, data.gov, Socrata, Gapminder, I mean, there are literally hundreds more of these sites that have data sets, uh, the estimate is a number in the millions, um, and they're free. You know, our understanding of these data sets and how to use them is becoming an essential literacy for our entrepreneurial success. You know, and I, and I mean entrepreneurial in the sort of innovation and problem solving sense. You know, it's, uh, this is really the only limiting factor right now in, in using this data for, uh, you know, for, for change. There are hundreds of potential global projects that could be designed around these data sets, probably thousands. Um, and already there are many out there, as you've seen in, in some of the presentations at this conference, there are other people out there doing, uh, doing great things around this. And so, you know, if all this data sitting out there in, you know, in silos that you can just download and use, if, if this weren't enough, well, we can always easily collect our own data collaboratively from people all over the world, from classrooms that we might share a project with, as if we were all in the same room. The prevalence of mobile devices, you know, in and out of the classroom, the ability to use $12 Arduinos and a few sensors to make data loggers, you know, for measuring, you know, home water usage, recycling composition, weather, uh, water quality, um, and hundreds of other things that we could, that we could look at simply by taking out our phones, filling out a form, or plugging in a sensor into, uh, into our computer with, you know, with some making knowledge and some little bit of engineering understanding. So, you know, the affordability of remote sensors now allows us to, you know, set up data stations outdoors, for example, that can, that could dump data all into one shared location. You know, this is imminently doable with the right skills and resources. Right? Right. Teresa says that data is the new oil, but it is much easier to find. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, if you, uh, I, I highly recommend taking some time, if you haven't already done so, taking some time, uh, you know, to read any one of the many good books out there on big data, both from the perspective of, of a learner and from an you know, ethics perspective. Fascinating stuff. Um, so, I'm going to be, I'm going to set an example now. And just a simple example of working through complexity with data that is visible in a way that we can interact it, with it. And this was not a global project. It's just a very um, clean example in my mind um, <clears throat> of how, in contextual, uh, of how data can help us solve problems. And, you know, it's remarkable how much clearer that a problem can become simply by exposing data and having a conversation around it, right? It's really dangerous to look at data as some sort of enlightened source that will answer all of our questions because it is not that. Um, it's not going to tell us what to do, but it is a start. And, you know, before we set off, for example, on a journey, a physical journey, 
you would of course want to know as much about the landscape or the currents or the weather or the people and the wildlife. You want to know as much as possible as you could, wouldn't you? Well, in the same vein, we wouldn't set out to solve problems without knowing as much as we can about the various factors that are influencing this problem. So this example I'm going to share, finding simplicity and complexity, was trying to understand why at my school at the time, if, we're, if we just kind of look in the upper, the upper left here, um, I was trying to understand why teachers were complaining that their students lacked data skills, lacked data analysis skills. You've probably heard this before at your own schools. Um, some of it was also coming from parents. Uh, you know, we got my, my child doesn't know how to analyze data. They never use data. You know, in the end, it seemed like, it, at the beginning, I should say, it seemed like it could be a fairly complex issue. I didn't really, I didn't even know where to start to, to, to dig into this. But I figured, well, let's look at our international research collaborative survey data. And I'll talk about that, exactly what that is in just a minute. Um, and I realized that we had a data point on that where we asked students the frequency uh, well, actually, we asked, we asked students and teachers, but what you're looking at here is the teacher data. We asked teachers, how frequently do you ask your students to create, analyze, collect, or process a data set? Right? And you can see in this graph that the frequency was quite low. You can see down here that every day, we had about three teachers that said they did that every day. And this, you know, this was in a large school. But we had quite a few teachers up at the top here that either did not respond to this question or said never. You know, a couple that did twice a year. You know, probably there's one unit that they did and they tried it out and that was it. Uh, you know, and so we had a lot in the lower to, to middle areas tapering off very, very dramatically towards the frequency. And then comparing that to, um, to, the, I hope I have the right slide in here actually. Oh yeah, I think I do. Um, comparing that to the overall, actually this is not the right, anyway, um, I can say, just, to, just to ignore the upper right here for a moment, I was going to talk about that, but for some, I had some, um, I had a, uh, a, a uh, another image on top of this. The, we were, we fell behind, we were quite a bit behind all other schools that took the survey, which compared the data with 30 or more schools at the time. And, you know, there were still a lot of those teachers in those other schools saying they never did it or they did it twice a year, but there were far more teachers as a per, on a percentage basis that were doing it every day. So, okay, so relative to other schools, the data was telling us that we indeed were not using a lot of data with our kids. So was it a technology issue? Were teachers just, you know, not really using technology all that much? Well, we could compare it to something else. You know, we asked them, how often do you present multimedia, for example? And you can see, you know, teachers are doing a lot of that. They are, you know, doing this every day, twice a week, depending on how frequently their class meets. Um, and very few teachers say they never do that. Um, so, and just as a side note, you can throw that in here. Here's the frequency of making. How often did our teachers say that they actually used making and tinkering and kids make build stuff in their classroom? And you can see that that was, that's pretty, actually, sorry, this is, this is all IRC data throughout all schools, you know, uh, in this collaborative, very few teachers um, say that they do these types of activities with their kids just to put things in perspective, I'll show you the kind of data that we collect in this. Um, and just before I move on, I'd like to ex just briefly explain. So the IRC, the International Research Collaborative, is a survey that's taken by schools uh, either before or after they implement a one-to-one -one program to help them understand uh, exactly what kids are doing with the technology in their schools. Uh, the frequency of use, their dispositions around their use, 
the access that they have to technology at home, um, and things like that, right? So, so what I did, hi Suda, with this data was really quite simple. I just organized some sessions with the different departments at our school, and I had them predict how frequently they might, they would say, you know, that how frequently do you think um, your kids and you say that you use data in the class? And surprisingly enough, the teachers' predictions actually were even less than the way they reported it earlier on um, in the year. And so we talked about that. And indeed, the it came down to a very simple issue in each and every one of those departments. It was in one department, you know, they, their data loggers uh, weren't charging. In, you know, in, uh, in another, in social studies, they just, they wanted a little bit of training. Um, you know, in math, some teachers were doing it, but um, they just didn't have a unit that they, that they felt uh, was right for that. And so we had a coach come in and help them with that. You know, I mean, there was just, there was always one simple solution. And in the end, you know, with just making a couple of minor tweaks, we were able to, within one year, increase that, so you can see this is really the same uh, uh, graph as before, we were able to increase the frequency of students creating and analyzing, collecting and processing data, um, <clears throat> to some extent, try, try, start to shift that towards more frequent use, uh, where our, our never kind of drop down in percentage, at least we bumped up that twice a year, once a month, and every day graphs. Um, and you know, hopefully you take away from this just a, <clears throat> it was actually interacting with other human beings that resolved the problem, <clears throat> but I was able to go into those conversations um, with information, right? So, move on. And this is where I'd like to start to address and bring in this notion of making. And, you know, if <clears throat> data helps us understand our problems better, then it really is the maker movement now that's going to help us do something about them. And this type of problem-based learning that that I've been talking about is more than just a math and data problem, right? The data helps us with actionable insights, but the solution to these problems involves creativity, often in the form of making something. <clears throat> and I've been working with project-based learning um, for a long time and have seen it move from simply, you know, making models to making websites and videos, and then seeing it now move back into bringing, making of tangible things, you know, real things that actually can solve problems uh, into that fold. And, you know, so, you know, kids might be making a water filter, but they're also making a website or a video that, that, that they can, so they can share how they made it and what it can do. And, um, you know, so, and this might even include building apps and other interactive tools that doesn't necessarily you know, have to be a physical object, but some sort of a, uh, an object that can, can take action, right? So, so Teresa says, putting a spotlight on the issue and using real data, right, has changed practice, right? Thank you, that was a little bit behind, but yes, spotlighting the issue with data and taking action, right? That's the theme here. So we are, let's look at, you know, what, there's this term that's been, has, you know, been around for uh, uh, a while, and I'm trying to bring those together, and that is, you know, global PBL and, and making, and I consider these to be a perfect match. Um, you know, thanks to Stanford Design, Stanford Design School, you can just, you can download this uh, design cycle and put it on your walls of your school, and begin to talk about what it means, you know. So let's take the data that we've downloaded and let's, let's ideate, let's define, let's prototype some solutions, let's test them out and let's repeat, right. And of course right there in the, in the blue, starting it all off, is empathizing, right. And this, 
this emphasizing comes from these intercultural exchanges, right, in these uh, intercultural exchanges. So it's all wrapped up in this, right? Um, or if that's too complex for you, then you could always just go to the one on the right, which is learn, make, and test. Uh, depends on your level of comfort with this. So, you know, uh, this, this is global PBL, uh, I think, for a lot of schools, is becoming a driver of getting our kids into these maker spaces. And, you know, currently as a consultant, I've seen quite a few schools with maker spaces that are really struggling to use them. They just really, okay, well, so what do we do? We go in here and we, you know, we, uh, we make a light light up and then, so yeah, what does that mean, right? But we want them going into these maker spaces to design, to prototype, to test, to rethink, to work on these global solutions so that our learners can explore the realities of global dynamics, right? And the challenges of creating real solutions for these complex problems. Um, so we're going to move on. So I'm going to, you know, kind of just give you a couple of examples on my peak your interest here. So global maker PBL sounds kind of scary, and it might be for some people. But think about how this can enhance the learning, um, you know, using, talking about what types of materials might be available locally in different parts of the world and how similar problems might be approached from, you know, from different angles, depending on your culture, what part of the world you're in, things you have access to. So imagine a global project, for example, in which students designed a way to collect you know, data remotely into a collaborative space like we've been talking about, um, perhaps about the irrigation water usage, you know, any sort of data around water, and use that data to design and make a solution to the problem we researched. You know, what if, for example, a large group explored the problems of affordable off-grid water pumping, something that is, that is very affordable to help solve problems of irrigation in under, underdeveloped areas and, you know, even <laughs> in some developed areas, depending on the power uh, reliability, and also access to clean water, you know, ending this long march um, of women from their villages to water sources, you know, far away. You know, wouldn't it be interesting to see how this and related problems that affect different areas of the world uh, how they affect these different areas of the world, and how would their designs be different to to find solutions uh, in these different areas? I mean, the economic takeaways from this would also be priceless. And uh, you know, this is just an example of a window into the complex uh, global dynamics that we've been we're trying to trying to um, make less complex, right, and more simple. Um, Right. So I, I guess I'm talking a little bit longer than I anticipated. It's 12:53. Hopefully, we have time for uh, some. I'm on my last slide, so here we go. Um, you know, so these types of uh, this picture is is from the beginning of my talk, and these types of learning opportunities that I've talked about and spaces. You know, they're more than just labs for STEM and STEAM. These spaces are as much about learner agency as they are about engineering. You know, this brings me back to the story I began with. And you remember those 15 kids at the start who are not hopeful for the future um, and how heartbreaking, you know, that can be? Well, after they took part in a day of making, which we call hard fun, and simply being creative and expressing themselves, these same 20 kids were then asked at the end of the day how optimistic they were about their future, and nearly every one of them raised their hand. Um, so I'd call that a success. And you know, this is a testament to the agency that we slowly strip away from our learners you know, when they aren't empowered to create and solve these real world problems that surround them. And it's also a source of hope for us all to know that by redefining this learning that we engage 
and with our students, that we can, I think, change the world. And that concludes my talk today. And I think that um, I just want to throw this up because if you if you have any interest in in emailing me and you know and asking questions about this talk or getting any of the slides or um, or just following me on Twitter, here is again. And I'd just like to know if you have any questions, what questions might you have? And what takeaways might you share further uh, with others? If you could just pop any of those in the chat room. I've got five minutes uh, here to answer those. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Kevin. And um, if you'd like to join me in thanking Kevin, there is an applause button just underneath your name where you can see the smiley face if you click on that. And you can add your applause. Thank you so much because that was Thank a really you. inspiring presentation with a very important message, which is we have an awful lot of young people sitting in classrooms doing um, standardized assessments and uh, things that actually won't make a difference <laughs> to their world, particularly, or certainly to the rest of the world. And uh, you've really given us an insight into how we could be doing something more meaningful for those young people and actually helping to address some of the huge and um, very difficult problems that, that face us and that in particular will face them um, as they go on um, in life. Um, thank you so much, Kevin. That was, that was great to have all that together. I've been um, retweeting and passing on some of the screenshots from your slides, so thank you for uh, for doing that because I think open sharing is actually very, very important as well to um, to get these messages out and to make connections because as you rightly said, there are people using um, open data, using projects um, in certainly in Europe and I'm sure around the world uh, and actually connecting people really helps. Absolutely. And Ruina, yeah, and if you have a good point there if about in here. making the learning real. Mm -hmm. Making the learning real. And if anybody out there has any great examples of this, of, of a project that uses data and that uses data to inspire making, uh, please share that with me. I think that's, you know, um, you know, these are, these are few and far between and we really try, want to try to make these things uh, systematic and easy for people to approach, you know. Yes, thanks Kevin, that's a great mm -hmm. reminder. I, I did share a link to uh, a webinar from the geo for all project, which uses right. open data for solving um, big problems. Uh, it's a huge project, lots and lots of impact, and it's sort of based within higher education. Um, but yeah, it'd be good to uh, connect these discussions. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Okay, so if you have any, if you have any, thank you for all the feedback. I appreciate this. Some really nice uh, comments from all of you. Um, if you have any, any questions, uh, please throw those in there. We've got just a couple more minutes. Mm. Yeah, just scanning through. I haven't picked up any questions as, as such at the moment. So Rowena says she'd like to get students to learn analysis of data, but have not considered creating data. Right. That's I think. Creating data is, is a great place to start, actually, because you can start with a fairly, you can create a fairly manageable data set that the students own and understand before moving on to downloading or finding a bigger data set. Right? So. And you, you mentioned as well maker spaces and making, and, and I'm sure some will be available, of, uh, will be um, aware already of the maker spaces movement. Um, Right. So plenty right. out there to uh, mm -hmm. to pull together, and um, and good to see many people um, following on Twitter and many people sharing their Twitter handles. Um, I tweet as at Warwick Language. Mm. Nice. Um, so please do share and connect that way because I'm for, I'm very sure that this is just the start of a conversation. There are lots and lots of uh, things to follow up. 
and there are many people who haven't made, managed to make it to this session but who will watch because of the way Steve and Lucy's organisation actually share the links to the recordings will be able to join us and, and watch um, later and pick up the messages that are here um, right. and that's really important right. um, because the conversations can continue. Right. Um, before I'm, I'm going to um, switch off the recording now so that um, we can get ready for uh, moving on to the next session. Many people will, I'm sure, be joining other sessions and